Hello to everyone, and uh, welcome to Experiments in Education, the third public panel of Asia Art Archives Art Schools of Asia Symposium. My name is Christopher Ho, and I am the Executive Director of Asia Art Archive. Over the years, Asia Art Archives Symposia have earned an enviable reputation for catalyzing groundbreaking scholarship and for convening the brightest minds around key topics. In 2013, sites of construction examined how exhibitions and catalogs uniquely contoured art history in China in the 1990s. In 2018, it begins with a story thickened the space between periodicals and publics and looked into how periodicals defined and cultivated alternative publics for art in Asia. Art schools in Asia likewise exhilarates, expands, and will doubtlessly resound. Those who listened to the previous two panels will know that careful research attends bold propositions. Today, we welcome Katie Bruin, Min Nguyen, Shan Shan Chen, followed by a presentation and response by Lily Chumley. With and through their scholarship, we will traverse the hemisphere from West Sumatra to Vietnam to China. Their case studies intersect with post-colonial histories, economic transformations, and emergent nationalisms, and point to the porousness of art, the imbrication of education, and the urgencies in experiments in art education. I would like to thank the Getty Foundation for their support through their Connecting Art Histories initiative. I now hand the floor over to my colleague, John Tang, Asia Art Archives Head of Research, the convener of Art Schools of Asia, and the moderator for this third public panel, Experiments in Education. Please welcome John. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the introductions and welcome everyone. Uh, it's my honor to welcome you to the Art Schools of Asia Symposium, and uh, which grows out of a seminar actually of the same name that began in October of 2021. It, um, we at the Asia Art Archive had the enormous privilege of convening monthly with the remarkable 18 emerging scholars who formed the Art Schools of Asia cohort. And the seminars with, uh, with them have taken us on journeys across time and geography from Shantinikitan, India in the first uh, early 21st, 20th century to uh, 1950s and 1980s China and Tibet uh, to post-colonial Yogyakarta and Bandung to then, then nascent nation state of Pakistan, to 1968 at the Istanbul Academy of Fine Art, and Hanoi in the Doimoi renovation 1990s. In revisiting these places and moments, the Art Schools of Asia program sought to highlight the under-recognized role played by such sites of teaching and learning to the development of modern and contemporary art across the region and beyond, but also to decenter art history and scholarship away from Euro-American paradigms. In other words, they explore the broader methodological and theoretical implications that thinking about schools and education have had for the writings of histories of art and institutions more broadly, while also from the perspectives, uh, while doing so from the perspectives of Asia. Over the course of this, these six sessions, the symposium is meant to offer a larger public the opportunity to take part in these discussions with the seminar participants themselves and with a number of esteemed and invited guest scholars to the Chum Link tonight. While we at Asia Art Archive like to say that art is knowledge, the work of these scholars suggests to us myriad ways just how knowledge is and could be taught and learned and serve as nodes around which social bonds could form and institutions built. How knowledge does not just exist, in other words, to be stored and collected in some static state, but to flow dynamically, transforming not just art, but also individuals and societies in the process. Experiments in education, the current panel, takes as its starting point a seeming contradiction between the two terms of experiments in education. Whereas one of the basic functions of education has been generally understood to be the reproduction of the existing social order, whether in the idea of the school as a factory 
or the negative connotations of the term academic as something that is traditional and hidebound. Experimentation in art, and especially modern art, contemporary art, uh, on the other hand, is often thought of as that which enables creativity and the breaking from tradition and convention. So what results when these two potentially contradictory terms come together? An experimental or avant-garde or aesthetics enters the institution of the school. Does the vanguard necessarily become institutionalized? Or are broader social changes a possible outcome? And if so, of what kind? And does the fact of a colonialist, as in the case uh, that Katie will be presenting today, or a socialist context in, uh, in San San, but also Lily, how did these alter how we th should think about all of these questions? These are some of the things that uh, topics that our speakers will be touching on today. And uh, the three speakers that I will be presenting in order of uh, their presentations are Katie Brunn, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. Her research interests cluster around, account, uh, around global modernisms and contemporary visual practice, with a focus on Southeast Asia generally and Indonesia specifically. Her dissertation considers processes of world making from a sub subnational position through its examination of the lives and work of visual artists associated with the Minangkabau ethnic group in Indonesia. Min Nguyen is a writer, editor, and curator based in New York. Currently associate arts editor at the Pioneer, Work, uh, Pioneer Works Art Foundation, her writing has appeared in Art in America, Freeze, MoMAS, Art Asia Pacific, and other publications. She has organized exhibitions and programs at Chicago Cultural Center, Wing Luke Museum, Gene Siskel Film Center, Northwest Film Forum, King Street Station, and Soil Gallery. She holds an MA in Modern and Contemporary Art History from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Chan Shan Chen obtained her PhD in art history from the University of Hong Kong. Currently, she is assistant professor in the School of Fine Arts at Shandong University of the Arts in China. She had also studied art history in the graduate programs at Princeton University and the University of Iowa in the United States. She has been part of a research project on Chinese contemporary art education entitled The Survey of Contemporary Art Education in the Global Context, organized by Zhonghua Yisu Yan Xiuyuan, the Chinese National Academy of Arts, and Guojia Dangdai Yisu Yan Xiu Zhongxing, the National Research Center for Contemporary Art. Uh, before passing the screen to our first speaker, Katie, um, I would like to acknowledge the Getty Foundation, as, Kate, uh, as Chris has done, um, but also our colleagues at AA, most especially our uh, team, teams in the programs department, Susanna Chung, Oskay Ersoy, and Rebecca Tso, and Talia Lam uh, in the research department. Last but not least, uh, I want to thank a few individuals at the Getty Foundation, Miguel de Baca, Helm Reich, and Joan Weinstein, uh, without whose support uh, for the Connecting Art Histories Initiative, this project would not have been possible. So now, without further ado, I turn things over to Katie. Thank you, John, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone for being here this evening, my time. Um, so I will share my screen. Okay. Um, so my presentation today is titled Nature Acts as Our Teacher, Art Making in and by Artist in Minangkabau, where the term Minangkabau refers to the ethnic group that is synonymous with the Indonesian province of West Sumatra. In order to help situate us geographically, I've circled the province of West Sumatra on this map of the Indonesian archipelago. And as I will elaborate throughout my presentation, the title of my presentation, Nature Acts as Our Teacher, is drawn from what in Minangkabau is the centrality of this adage to everyday life and what is referred to as adat or the customary norms that structure Minangkabau society that in turn had a significant impact on the shape of the curriculum of a school known as INS Kayutanam. Founded in 1926, the history and character of this school will be the primary focus of my presentation that is interested in what role INS Cayutanam, hereafter just INS, played in the early history of arts education in Indonesia generally, and this region, West Sumatra specifically, that can be viewed as a kind of peripheral node of Indonesia's larger art world that has long been centered on the island of Java. 
Um, so to give you a sense of where my presentation is headed, I wanted to first provide you with a roadmap. From here, I will move first to a discussion of the history of INS in relation to another progressive model of education that was founded in Indonesia during the late colonial era, known as Taman Siswa. I will explain that like INS, Taman Siswa is significant both because of the emphasis it placed on local values and the position of arts in its curriculum. This will in turn be followed second by a look at how the notion that nature acts as our teacher relates to the synthesis between Islam and Minangkabau culture um, that thus had an influence on the founder of INS, a man named Muhammad Shaifi. I will then conclude very briefly with a look at the position of the arts within the structure of INS, as well as the contribution that the school has made to the history of painting in the region of West Sumatra specifically and Indonesia more generally. Um, so then moving first to the history of INS and its relationship to Taman Siswa. The establishment of INS in 1926 occurred in the context of Indonesia's nationalist movement at a time when access to education for the general populace of what was then the Dutch East Indies remained limited and was almost entirely dependent on schools established by the colonial regime and thus accessible only to those part of an elite class. In this context, figures like Mohamed Chaifi, the founder of INS who is pictured here, envisioned the development of institutions that it would help to educate a larger portion of the population as a means to not only aid in the struggle for independence, but also to foster individuals that would help to build an independent state. When INS was founded, Shaifi was not alone in his efforts to develop a model of education alternative to the Western or, or colonial system, but rather took inspiration from another progressive model of education known as the Taman Siswa system, that was initiated in the city of Yogyakarta on the island of Java in 1922. And the reason why I draw attention to Taman Siswa is because of the close relationship of each school's founder to one another, as well as what are parallels that exist in the structure and goals of each institution. In addition, it's important to highlight the fact that today, while we know a good amount about Taman Siswa and recognize it for its contribution to the early history of modern art in Indonesia, INS receives almost no attention, despite what I will show was also its contribution in this area. This reality can be attributed to two key factors. First, in contrast to Taman Siswa, which quickly established branches across the archipelago, INS has only ever been a single institution in West Sumatra. Second, whereas both schools are still in existence today, INS has had a tumultuous history due to the political context in West Sumatra during and after the revolutionary struggle that meant periods of inactivity. Um, but what I really wanna focus on are the influences that shaped Taman Siswa uh, and subsequently INS, because in the kind of conceptualization of INS, its founder was very much in conversation with the founder of Taman Siswa. So both the founder of Taman Siswa, Ki Hajar Dewan Toro, and Mohamed Shaifi came from privileged backgrounds that afforded them the opportunity to study at colonial schools in the Dutch East Indies, as well as the Netherlands. Thanks to the time spent abroad, thanks to his time spent abroad, Ki Hajar Dewan Toro came into contact with progressive models of education, ranging from Montessori, Froebel, Dalton, to, to, to Tagore system at Santa Nicotin. This led to the development of a system at Taman Siswa that embraced philosophies like student-centered learning as a means to foster self-expression. At INS, there was also a strong focus on less hierarchical relationships between student and teacher as a means to create independent thinkers. However, what was particularly significant about both of these schools was the attention to local values drawn from the cultures in which each was established. In the case of Taman Siswa, this was Javanese culture, while INS was shaped by Minangkabau society. And for those of you who are less familiar with Indonesian demographics, there are approximately 300 ethnic groups that comprise this country of which Javanese and Minangkabau are two. And whereas Javanese is the largest ethnic group um, con con constituting approximately 45% of the population, Minangkabau comprises only 2.75% of the population, which is another factor why Taman Siswa has had um, a much greater recognition and dominance uh, in contrast to INS. 
But what then did attention to local values mean and why was this significant? Amongst those that were active in nationalist organizations like Mohamed Shaifi and Kihajar Dewan Toro in the late 1920s and early 1930s, debates were beginning to swirl regarding what the shape of an independent Indonesia might look like. While there was significant attention to the effects and importance of modernization, there was also recognition of the importance of maintaining indigenous values and cultural practices like the use of local languages and attention to local forms of expression so as to set apart and demonstrate um, pride in Indonesia's heritage following nearly 300 years of colonial oppression. At Thomas, Tom and Siswa, this meant attention to Javanese philosophy and con concepts like tata tentrum, which can be translated as order and peace. While in West Sumatra, what has long been a unique relationship with the natural world shaped Shaifi's pedagogical outlook. Um, which takes us to the second part of my presentation, focused on the significance of this notion that nature should act as our teacher to both Minangkabau and INS. So in order to preface my consideration of why nature acting as our teacher matters to both Minangkabau and INS, I would like to look at this drawing that was done by Mohamed Shaifi sometime in the 1960s, um, so not shortly before his death. As is noted on a, in a biography on Shaifi, as a boy, he dreamed of becoming a painter like Radin Saleh, who was active in the 18th century and is recognized as Indonesia's first fine artist. And while Shaifi did have the opportunity to both study and teach art prior to his establishment of INS, he of course did not fulfill this dream. Nevertheless, we do have some kind of rare examples that demonstrate his abilities, like this drawing done with ink on paper. If we look at this drawing, we see a young man kneeling on what appears to be a prayer rug in a clearing with his head bowed, eyes closed, and hands raised with palms facing upward in prayer. Above him, the Arabic word for God radiates what appear to be five rays of light that fall onto the earth as well as the man's head, effectively connecting all three and pointing to a kind of harmony between God, man, and the natural world. Despite the fact that Minangkabau constitutes a relatively small portion of Indonesia's overall population, it has, received a it has received significant attention and scholarship. This is because of what can be seen as its defining, albeit paradoxical characteristic, namely the coexistence of a matrilineal alongside the practice of Islam, a religion that is, of course, by and large patriarchal. If we take this drawing then as a kind of repre representation of what makes the symbiosis possible, it is an extraordinary representation of the principles that are not only central to Minangkabau society, but also shaped Muhammad Shaifi's curriculum at INS. So let me explain this as, as succinctly as possible. While today Minangkabau is separable from the practice, practice of Islam, this was not always the case. As with other parts of the archipelago, prior to the arrival of Islam beginning in the 13th century, life was dictated by animist systems and the presence of Hindu Buddhist kingdoms. While in certain areas, existing belief systems were replaced entirely by Islam, in Minangkabau, the matrilineal and subsequently an adherence to certain customary norms persisted thanks to what was the relationship of each to the natural world. One of what I believe is the most helpful descriptions that explains this comes from Minangkabau philosopher M. Nasrun, um, who states the following, um, the quote that I put on this slide. The early process of Islamization in Minangkabau did not occur by force, but rather a redefinition of the Minangkabau world in order to accommodate Islam. This was possible because the customary norms of Minangkabau society, known as adat, have always been based on certainties contained in nature or the idea that we should take nature as our teacher. While in the Quran, God indicates that he reveals some of his secrets through nature to, through nature, to those who can interpret nature properly. Um, so while Mohammed Shaifi was in fact not ethnically Minangkabau, he grew up in this region in a family that was Minangkabau. The influence that this had on him is indicated across his writings in which he demonstrates his reverence for both God and God's creation, understood as the natural world, the latter of which was a driving force in his thinking and subsequently his outlook as a pedagogue. For example, 
As he states in one of his many texts on the basic principles of education associated with INS, I quote, by acknowledging the existence of God, it is clear that we also acknowledge God's creation. We observe and investigate these creations, the result of which forms the primary base of INS. This is not to say that INS was an Islamic school. However, because it was located in a region in which relig religion is inseparable from everyday life, or being Minangkabau, spirituality did play a key part in INS's curriculum and the de development of what Shaifi referred to as active humans, a notion that was based on his own observation of the natural world that he explained in his writings is always in the process of growth and development. For example, in the same text that is quoted on this slide, Shaifi demonstrates what he means by the term active human through an expose pages long that touches on topics ranging from how a seed turns into a plant to the way that ants build mounds as a means to preface his assertion that all things, be they inanimate or animate, possess this active character that results in some kind of a product thanks to the workings of God Almighty. So it was ultimately at INS his goal to foster individuals who would produce something um, like the natural world. So then with this understanding and with very little time left, I want to move to the final section of my presentation that is focused on the place of arts within the curriculum at INS, as well as the significance of this school for our understanding of the history of art in Indonesia. From the outset, INS's curriculum was divided into four areas, including academic, practical, spiritual, and student-based subjects. While each area had its own purpose and significance, each was integral to the development of a well-rounded student capable of contributing to society. Along with religion and sport, art fell into the category of spiritual education because it was understood to help shape the mental attitude of students rather than their expertise in a particular area. Along with literary, dramatic, and musical arts, fine art and craft were taught as indicated by these photographs that show students working with clay and creating baskets taken sometime in the 1950s. However, what I find to be the most notable aspect of the arts education offered by INS is the role played by one of Indonesia's most well-regarded landscape painters, known as Wakiti, in its first decade of observation, um, whose characteristic style is demonstrated by this painting that was done sometime in the 1940s. Well, unfortunately, I've not found any visual documentation of what the painting studios at INS looked like, we do know that Wakiti taught at this school for a number of years, working with individuals who would eventually leave West Sumatra in order to continue their study of painting in Java or the nation center, including Mokhtar Apin and Zaini, who are both recognized for their contributions to the history of Indonesian modernism. This is significant because it counters how we might look at Wakiti's legacy. Because Wakiti was trained in the style of Dutch landscape painting, in the historiography of Indonesian modern art, he is positioned as a Moy Indi artist or painter of the beautiful Indies. And because during the revolutionary era, it was this style that served as a counter or point of resistance for revolutionary painters that instead sought to depict the realities of the people, from the 1950s, the activities and work of individuals like Wakiti received little to no attention. While neither Mokhtar, Apin, or Zaini, these individuals that studied at INS with Wakidi, would go on to paint landscapes like their teacher, knowing that their earliest training was at an institution such as INS under a teacher like Wakidi has the potential to shift how we think about the legacies of this style in a region like West Sumatra, where, as I have demonstrated throughout this presentation, the natural world holds a particular significance. So then, um, just to conclude really briefly, in this presentation, I have provided you with information regarding the history of a school founded in West Sumatra, Indonesia in 1926, known as INS Kayutanam, that can be compared to another better known model of progressive education in Indonesia called the Taman Siswa system that was also established in the late colonial era. While both of these schools place significance on local values drawn from the cultures of the populations where they were founded, INS differs from Tom and Siswa in its attention to the part nature can play in teaching us to be active humans. In, our, in regards to our interest in arts education in Asia, 
both INS and Taman Siswa are significant because prior to the establishment of formal art academies in Indonesia in the post-independence period, these schools served as sites for the transference of knowledge regarding drawing and painting that in the case of West Sumatra cannot be separated from a longer history of landscape painting. Um, so with that, I will conclude and thank you all and look forward to the coming presentation. Thank you, Katie. So now I uh, hand the uh, mic over to uh, Yen. Thanks, John. Um, thank you everybody for joining me today and us and Asia Art Archive for the opportunity of the symposium, but also the seminar, which has been really amazing to think with all these scholars around the world. Um, I'm going to share some thoughts around my research as it pertains to the title of this panel, Experiments in Education, um, as it relates to my work on contemporary Vietnam in the late 80s and 90s and onwards. I also am a little worried about my internet connection because I'm remote, so I hope I don't glitch too much. And if I do, don't remember me like this. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I perpetually return to, um, including the production of social space as artwork, the relationships between conceptualism and language, what possibilities this language makes in places of state suppression, the role of the artist in the public sphere, and um, I think a recurring, a prominent theme in my work is also pivots and reorientations. And I tried to pack a lot of tendrils into this presentation, frankly, too much for this time span. And hopefully that will give a good holistic overview and not be too um, fragmented. And I'll also try to end with some stakes, lingering questions that still preoccupy me today. Slide change, please. So some brief context about the contemporary art scene in Vietnam, this image is from Salon Natasha, which was these two artists' homes where a lot of the experimental DIY art practices happened in the 90s, and I think really speaks to the, like, the DIY experimental, very scenes-based nature of contemporary art in Vietnam, which uh, the arrival of which is sort of historicized along with the 1986 Doi Mai Socialist Market Economic Reforms. Um, this was a moment when the, the doors were seen as open to the rest of the world um, when it, it also signaled a time when Vietnam severed relationships with the Soviet Union, which dissolved in the early 90s and built a recuperative relationship with the US. Um, the US lifted trade embargoes in 94, and then later the country entered the World Trade Organization in the 2000s. And art history is sort of historicized around this time too as sort of the arrival of, of globalized contemporary art. And you kind of see this with international contemporary art in general of this moment of like deterritorialization. Um, and art historians have written that in the early nineties, it was as if all arts writing had centered on this image, this allegory of a once repressed and now suddenly free, liberated and liberal Vietnam. So around this time you saw a lot of like it it's sort of seen and narrativized as sort of like an explosion of um a long belated freedom of expression open open emotion um subjectivity um and then a lot of different kinds of forms to performance installation found object slide change please and like salon natasha there were a lot of different independent art spaces that formed or or rather, there were a lot of different collective groups um, varying on professional or institutionalized around this time. And one space that I'm really interested in is called Sand Art, which formed in 2007 and still operates today. And when it did form, it was formed by artists Din Kule, Tuan Anju Nguyen, Phu Nam Tuk Ha, and Tiffany Chung, who were all artists who had studied abroad and come back to Vietnam to start this art space. Slide change, please. And what interests me about San Art in particular is its orientation around providing structured artistic training, um, almost in a para-academic way. And what I mean by that is the trainings, I, maybe because of the formal educations of the artists, resembled art schools, like MFA programs, but wasn't an accredited program. So it offered 
exhibition spaces, residency programs, workshops, seminars, had a reading room um, like this picture here of books on art theory and criticism. And a lot of this was provisional and necessary to build infrastructure for um, the arts where there wasn't one. And um, it a lot of it also was professionalizing this energy that was around at the time. And a lot of this energy was, as I mentioned, this move away from media mastery, which the established schools offered, which were modeled after the Beaux Arts French colonial models of where you go learn about silk painting, lacquer painting. But here there was more of an idea that creativity was something innate to the artists themselves that um, they applied to whatever they did and that the material was like less, less important for that. Um, so one example of that is one of the artists who participated in a program there, Trung Kong Tung, reflects that what was significant at the lab was the encouragement to experiment in various media from powdered paint, video art, sculpture using polyester to artworks that are induced from field work methods. Slide change, please. Um, and an aspect that I'm really interested in is this emphasis on dialogic and discursive skills um, or the practice of articulating one's ideas through written and verbal language, which San Art seem to really emphasize. And again, in, in a like professionalizing way of a lot of the energies that were happening around there, like it wasn't um, unprecedented, like surely before in artists' living rooms or at their houses, people would talk about works and that would be very generative for the making of the work, but it was more structured here into like a crit model. So one program for instance, pictured here is called San Art Laboratory, which was basically like a US studio critique model. And in their call for proposals in 2012, um, the lab invites artists to participate in regular writing and discussions of their works with a talking partner. So even that term for a mentor, like the talking partner, just sort of like the emphasis on speech and development of language. Um, and this relates to what Lily has written about in her work on post-socialist China too, and our education there, which is, is something I read a lot when I was thinking about this, of the formation of language communities in these kinds of spaces and how artists in like dialogic spaces are organizing language communities around shared codes and sign systems. And insofar as objects are regarded as possessing a communicative capacity, artists sort of become their speakers. Slide change, please. And I think this is contemporaneous to the broader history of conceptual art or like the broader history of art moving from object to idea that the more artworks are de dematerialized, the apparatus of language grows larger or the, um, as the, the retinal field or like the field of artistic vision is deprioritized, you have like a greater interpolation of language. So, I think that it's the language development aspect is a byproduct of the emergence of conceptual art in Vietnam, but I think it also takes a really particular form there with the, the state's conditions and strictures around artistic production, um, specifically with its censorship and red tape, and which is kind of omnipresent and repressive in Vietnam. So all programs have to apply for an official exhibition permit with the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism. There's a lot of paperwork. Um, it's a very repressive system, but at the same time, it's very disorganized, arbitrary and corrupt. There's a lot of bribery that happens. Um, there's not a lot of consistency with certain kinds of censorship. There's, yeah, just a lot of disorganization. So it's, it's not a coherent system. And um, a scholar named Samantha Libby, who has written about censorship in the art scene in Vietnam, writes that the changing scope of art makes censorship a labyrinthian situation and therefore one to be gamed. So she 
interviewed a lot of artists, some anonymous, some not, who admitted to sort of like the the gaming aspect of of trying to evade the censors. And here the the conceptual and open interpretive nature of art kind of gives artists the upper hand in some ways she poses. And um, in my conversations with artists, uh, they also corroborate that the, the lack of education among government officials help artists engage in veiled social commentary. And you can see this in a few ways. Um, one, for instance, is some art exhibitions, there will be like four different press releases generated. So there's one that they use to apply to the 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 ministry there's there's the one that they will put on like the Vietnamese press there's the one that they'll put on the international press and they're all like slightly different um another way is the the bureaucrats usually come to check an exhibition before it opens and the ways that curators and artists can give them a tour um can they can say completely different things in that tour and like completely explain the works differently and explain it in a different way with like their inner circles or at the opening with artists. And so there's sort of this like accordion like shape of interpretation that I think is like very compatible with what happens at like the language trainings or like the, the spaces of crits or workshops where people are constantly like reinterpreting things. And I think though the language trainings may not explicitly be about outmaneuvering the state, I think in most cases, artists just want to say what they want to say and the state antagonizes them and they don't want it to. Um, I think it's interesting that the, the language training places kind of become a site for the skill development in doing so. And I think that's very unique to like this government or, or like this yeah, this regime or like similar kinds of sensorial regimes. Slide change, please. So another, I'll, I'll explain these works in a bit, but um, another pivot that I am really interested in, um, aside from the, the medium specificity to like the whole artist is the shifting role of the artist in the public sphere and how much this pivot has happened in the last century and how it's like the the dizzying nature of it is still sort of reflected in the art scene today so in a statement in a talk um that curator zoe butt and din kule uh, curators of san art for a long time gave at asia archive in america in 2014 um, they say today the social role of the artist in vietnamese society is rather confused um, limited to youthful aspirations and ideas of materiality, as opposed to challenging the methods of society or the right to freedom of speech and civil liberties. And they add that a lot of the artists are more interested in maybe like an art for art's sake or like an escapism. And I think that this is a direct byproduct of like the recent history of politicization of art from the communist government. And so, after the communist victory and reunification in 1975, the Arts Association was established to oversee that all artistic production upholds socialist standards and had this very strict ruling on what like a socialist art meant. And many artists from the South were imprisoned in re-education camps or works destroyed. And I think the, the memories of those abuses loom in the air and still manifest today in less spectacular, but nonetheless, like stifling bureaucratic violences that I mentioned earlier, where officers are always thwarting exhibitions without reason, confiscating government, or sorry, confiscating equipment, and even in some high profile cases, arresting artists. So it's like to make political work is very risky. And, and I think on the additional hand, um, I think that when the when the idea of political engagement is like imposed in such a way, but people are going to rebel to assert their agency and um, move away from that. So 
I think what I understood from that talk that Zoe Indian gave was this encouragement to sort of reclaim or recuperate the idea of social commentary or social engagement and what that could mean outside of state definitions and encourage artists to, to use art to think outside themselves and to think about history and social dynamics and, and political engagement in a context where a lot of that info is constricted anyway. Um, and then this slide speaks to um, just like the dizzying reorientations of this in the past century. Um, Tong Yakfan is a very prominent modern painter who was trained in the Beaux Arts School and was making oil modernist works that you see on the left. And in a very short amount of time, like after the August revolution, went to the resistance zone and started making socialist realist works that you see on the right. So I think you can see these reorientations in the recent history, but also in like particular oeuvres of artists themselves. Slide change, please. Um, so I'm running out of time, but I guess I will end on this question of production space or production of social space as artwork. And um, as Aquion Weezer has written in Collectivism After Modernism, an anthology on the, the idea of the artist as producer, um, he's written that historically collectives tend to emerge during periods of crisis in moments of social upheaval and political uncertainty within society. And I think this is a great query for thinking about what these activities tell us about the times we're in, in Vietnam. Um, and I think to me, they point to a post-socialist time. And, and what I mean by that is like after the free market modernization and the booming economic growth and rapid expansion, there's, there's still a lot of constrictions around civil liberties and free speech. So the freedom associated with the free market economy is like a facade that is constantly shifting and it's it distills like a utopic and ambiguous myth of a democracy expanding through market forces, leaving behind shock and disappointment, but also a kind of mutative state apparatus. And um, I, I find some contradictions in that, but maybe we'll talk about that in the discussion that on the one hand, these, or, or I guess not on the one hand, I'll just, and with this thought that in these new conditions that we are presented with means through which people imagine resistance to the state and what we see in these independent art practices are the ways in which art is reimagined as a sphere for thinking, gathering, sharing information. Um, yeah, I'll stop there and maybe we can talk more later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, and yeah, next we will have Sansan who will be presenting. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to, to join the symposium. Uh, the topic of, of my presentation is the Wang Gap class, a case study of the first experimental art program in China. As early as the modern art movement in the 1980s, some Chinese artists tried to challenge the old institutional system in order to innovate Chinese art. Since then, Chinese artists and art, art educators have been engaged in exploring more space for artistic innovation. Until 2000s, they began to build a new program of experimental art with Chinese characteristics at some of the major art academies in China. Thus, Chinese, uh, Chinese experimental art began to be incorporated into the academic system of Chinese art education. It means that contemporary art education is now able to make a breakthrough within the mainstream of academic realism that have been dominant in almost all the official art schools and academies in China since 1949. As some scholars and researchers have focused much on the unofficial art while neglecting this critical transformation within the academic system, this research aims to address the phenomenon of the rise of experimental art in the education system. In this talk, I chiefly work on the materials concerning the building of the first experimental art program at Central Academy of Fine Arts in China, especially its pedagogical methodology and curriculum. First of all, I investigate how Chinese art educators define the concept of experimental art with Chinese characteristics 
in the Chinese academic system during the 2000s. In addition, I introduced the initiative of the first experimental art program at CFA by Professor Lu Shengzhong and the program, then the program's formation process and organization pattern. Through focusing on its several core courses, I investigate how the fundamental principle on which the program is structured, how it challenges the mainstream of academic realism, and what kind of transformation that it has brought about to the academy's traditional education model. Uh, Wu Hong has defined in the 1990s as a period of experimentation in his monograph, Contemporary Chinese Art, a History, 1970s to 2000s. For him, first of all, experimental art in the 1990s marked a transition from absorbing the influence of Western modern art to an emphasis on localization through the exploration of Chinese experiences. His boundary is changeable according to the relationship between experimental artists and political authorities, academicism, mass culture, and commercial market. In addition, experimental art of this period is characterized by an alienation from the state ideology and academic training, and in many situations being antagonistic to institutional control. Furthermore, being anti-aesthetic, it stresses the role of social observation and critique in art creation. However, when Professor Lu Shengzhong established the first program of experimental art at the Central Academy of Arts, he took a, a strategic uh, approach in defining Chinese experimental art as a new art form with Chinese characteristics, which is less radical and antagonistic to the state authorities, but more compatible with the educational institutes. He has defined experimental art as different from traditional fine arts, including oil painting, printmaking, and sculpture. Basically, it is an art form that is determined by various methodologies for art creation. Born in Pingdu County, Shandong Province in 1952, Lu Shengzhong is a contemporary Chinese artist who seeks inspiration from folk arts and innovates and enriches his artistic expression through negotiating the art forms of both the past and the present and local and the world. He's not, well, he's not only well known for his small red figures in the 98 and in the 85 new wave, but also for his role as the founding director of the experimental art program at CAFA. He described the reason why he became interested in setting up this new art program was only to his observation and study and the carcel documentary in Germany. The travel to Germany enabled him not only to get a sense of contemporary world art, but also helped him to learn no, more knowledge about education model at German institutes. He strongly felt that he should convince knowledge to Chinese students and taught them art besides drawing skills. According to the report on experimental art delivered in a special workshop on special session at CFA on, April, on May 26, 2011, Chinese education authorities explain that, quote, experimental art takes significant ideas as premise of artistic expression and seeks appropriate formal language to achieve the creation of artworks for the public and the society, unquote. Chinese experimental art includes comprehensive materials and technology, digital technology, photographer and video, sound, body, and performance, ecological and environmental art. According to this official document, the art display stresses, there's no need for China to build itself entirely in accordance with the Western contemporary art education model, nor should it replace or negate the traditions of the original teaching system formed over the past 100 years. Therefore, as it states, quote, Chinese experimental art will be complementary to the old system in order to achieve the completion of Chinese art education, unquote. According to this definition, it could be observed that Chinese characteristics have several major features. First of all, it emphasizes significant ideas and appropriate language which set up the requirements for artistic subjects and a limitation for artistic expression. Second, they offer more freedom for artists to choose a variety of media, not confined to traditional media that make a breakthrough in the dominant field of oil painting. Third, 
Although experimental art has absorbed the Western influences, it must remain independent from the Western art education model. It is expect, expected to conform to Chinese education tradition and complement rather than conflict with the existing institutional system. Experimental art program could be, uh, can be the experimental art studio, which was established in 2005 School of Classic Arts at Central Academy of Fine Arts. When the first group of students of experimental art applied for the admission to CFA in 2004, there was yet no such experimental art program until one year later, into 2005. The faculty members at the start of this program, including Lu Shengzhong, Han Ning, Hu Mingzhu, and Wu Jian, as shown in the slide, um, usually first, uh, first year students at CFA were required to enter the fundamental department of the School of Plastic Arts to gain basic training in realism. It includes drawing, delineation, anatomy, color, and so on. After this year, they would have the freedom to choose among oil painting, printmaking, sculpture, mural painting, or experimental art. 14 students became the first group of students who entered the experimental art program as listed in the slide. Uh, they were called the Vanguard class. These students all, accepted, uh, all had accepted strict training in painting skills before they entered the academy. The fundamental principle for structuring the whole experimental art program was to first to teach students various methodologies to develop a concept or idea and then broaden the ways to realize this idea, and finally to learn how to apply different skills and media to achieve the goal of art creation. Therefore, there are 24 courses designed for the Vanka class as listed in curriculum from 2004 to 2008 on the slide, and also I have translated these 25 courses uh, names. Uh, through examining the topics of this, these courses, I conclude that they emphasize the following five aspects. First, the art research applies a sociological perspective and emphasizes aesthetic investigation. And second, the art creation no longer insists on academic realism, but requires various kinds of real analysis so as to achieve real transformation. Third, the students are required to carry out transmedia experimentation. And fourth, they are encouraged to investigate forecasts and crafts besides traditional art. And last, they obtain the opportunities to learn contemporary art theories and practices and are engaged in curatorial practices. Most of these courses combine lectures, seminars, discussions, and art creation and practice in which the students are encouraged to challenge the traditional way of thinking and their perception and creation and required to learn data collecting and analyzing in order to develop a logic and critical thinking as well as cultivate great creativity and innovation in transforming their very experiences. So these two slides show some images of the experimental art class and some of the students' artworks. <clears throat> so I will give several course examples in the following discussion. For the first aspect of emphasizing sociological investigating, investigation, the course investigation of the aesthetic taste of Chinese families were taught by professors Wu Shengzhong and Wu Jian who describe its objective as, quote, learn the society and the public artistic taste and build a bridge between the public and the artists with a positive and active, and active attitude, unquote. This course requires students to work out questionnaires and learn to conduct in the of the public in order to examine the complex forces behind the formation of certain tastes of different families through data collecting and analyzing. This map, shows the different region areas that each student conducted the research. And the next image shows the parts of the pictures the students created to record the things that different families decorate their homes. This course was the very first one that the 14 students were required to take and the finished assignments during the following summer vacation. Thus, they were able to grasp the knowledge of basic sociological methods that were believed to prepare them well for their further studies in other areas. Among all the other courses, the most fundamental one is the original plasticity. Um, in this course, students not only learn to break away from the uniqueness 
uniqueness of scientific cognition method, but also get exercise in thinking and observation method, usually leading to the freedom of visual expression. For the past 100 years development, CFA has laid great importance to joint skills. Xu Beihong has quoted from the doctrine of the mean and used, quote, penetrates the refined and subtle to the end and reaches the breadth and greatness, unquote, to instruct, to instruct the importance of joint skills and plasticity since CFA was established in 1918. But in this course, Yu Xiongzhong experimented to train students to create artworks in what he called the normal way, that is no longer confined to realism, but explore more freedom in representing their subjects. So the whole course is designed for two semesters and four weeks per semester, and this is consists of seven units. So you can see in the slides, such as the preparation for plastic expression, expression and um, the association and the illusion, uh, like general, generalization of impression. Uh, so here is some of the students' artworks, and especially this one. For example, in the last session, it's called generalization of impression. The student named Chen, Chen Mingqiang in his work, The Shaw Words, explains how general expression replaces many details and individuality and made our world appear uniform through depicting a sculptural image showered with all different descriptive words. The subject of this image echoes the traditional Chinese verbal expression, the jail of words. The most innovative aspect to, to, to traditional art form is the utilization of various media. In the course, materialization of artistic expression, which was taught by Professor Zhang Guolong, the student was encouraged to work out artworks in different media, which they eventually would show in the final exhibition entitled the desire of materials and no desire. They were expected to work from and rediscover the, the tradition through comprehensive materials or the method of transmedia in order to achieve the representation of original art creation. So here is the image of the student's artwork by using various media. The experimental art studio also invited foreign scholars to teach, including the German artist uh, sex secure uh, Drexler, who was responsible for the um, expression of, of conceptual art. Besides lecturing, students in this class were expected to cultivate their creativity to engage themselves in experimental art projects. One of the most interesting ones was the Wild Wildflowers Group, conducted by three undergraduate female students, Li Meng, uh, Fu, Ye Fu, Na, and Dong Yuan. In this project, they put on a cheering score dance in the Beijing art districts and contemporary artists' studios in order to gain the opportunity to interview these famous artists. And then they also video recorded. It won many artists' interests, such as the photo, photo show, the contemporary artists like Zhang Xiaogang, who also joined the performance. Professor Liu Xiongyun commented, quote, admiring the teeth, passionate and rational, premeditation and improvisation are all indistinguishable. And when Wildflowers left. This mannequin created through mixing is everywhere, unquote. Another important methodology, uh, pedagogical method was to require students to keep a very diary in which they recorded their daily activities and artistic feelings and inspirations that later became important resources for their artistic creation. The pedagogies described above emphasize a new path of art creation through developing the students' own concepts and then applying different methodologies and finally realizing these concepts by various media and artistic skills. Thus, the experimental art program has challenged the formal system of academic training in developing solely skills in most Chinese art academies. In 2008, when 14 students of the Wanga class finished their four-year undergraduate study, they curated their graduation exhibition and the supervisation of Professor Liu Xiongzhu and Wu Jian that aroused great attention among the public and many contemporary artists, such as Xu Jianguo and Xu Bing. In addition, the students also worked out their research thesis, whose title ranged from various social and artistic investigations, art creation statements to contemporary art observation that proved to be highly original and innovative. But as the Wanga class graduated in 2008, the global financial crisis high happened that made their job hunting very difficult. 
Some students choose to continue postgraduate study, and some became individual artists in Beijing. On April 8, 20, uh, 2011, CFA organized harmonious but different, oh, sorry, harmonious but different, the second academic experiment art documentary exhibition in which some of the vanguard class students participated. So this is, and this is the exhibition image. Uh, this conference and the following establishment of the National Experimental Art Committee on April, the 15th, April 14th, 2011, and CFA finally signified the official acceptance of uh, experimental art within the Chinese academic and institutional field. The committee became an essential component of Chinese Artists Association, and later the Department of Experimental Art with a clear structure was created at CFA, as shown in the slide, and later the School of Experimental Art in 2015. In conclusion, in defining Chinese experimental art within the academic system, Chinese educators stresses Chinese characteristics, which has, though has absorbed some Western influences, is expected to be localized in China's current social, political, and cultural context. Its new curriculums and pedagogies discussed in the earlier part did make a breakthrough not only in the mainstream of academic realism in China, but also transformed part of the traditional pedagogies in some important art academies through cultivating the students' artistic creativity, critical thinking, and active participating, participation. The building of experimental art as seen in the example of the Art class at CFA paved the way for a new direction for contemporary art education, which has enabled itself to gain more or less legitimacy on China's art scene. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much Natak, for that uh, stimulating uh, presentation. And at this point, um, we will have a quick round of uh, questions and answer for the three panelists before I then uh, invite Lily to make some remarks. Um, and uh, I want to uh, let the audience know that you should feel free to ask questions. And in fact, we have a question already, but um, I, I wanted to kind of maybe make a few points um, uh, before I, I pass along to the question. And one of them has to do with the, the way that um, I think between the three of you, uh, the presentations, one of the interesting things that I, I'm hearing is, uh, is the kind of the way that um, education, all three of your cases, is um, understood less as a, about the acquisition of skills. Um, that is to say about like learning how to do something uh, manual, um, uh, craft-based, and more about learning how to think or how to kind of talk. Right. I mean, I think Min, you you made this very clear in your uh, presentation in terms of how um, the, the kind of discursive program, right, and the way that language based training, you know, is part of really what um, San Art is kind of doing. And San San, I think, you know, um, what was like um, really kind of stunning about that the the slide with the twenty five courses for the experiment. I mean, that seemed like it was all about kind of you know like this very um, esoteric and mind numbing kind of like listing of like, okay, this is like how you, this is how you become an experimental artist. But in some ways, uh, one of the things that you um, point out also is that, you know, it's like, there isn't, uh, it's not kind of like traditional, it's not like the tradition, it's defined, the experimental art program is defined in opposition or distinguishes itself from the more traditional programs through the kind of the way that emphasizes certain ways of thinking, right? Um, which are not necessarily about skills acquisition. And Katie, I think, you know, in your presentation, I think the, the role of art um, uh, in the case of INS is less about, you know, like the, the passing on of certain forms of craft traditions than a certain kind of spiritual practice. So in that way, there is like a kind of continuity between the three of you uh, in the way I think that, you know, art becomes a kind of less, um, um, a kind of a manual practice, a kind of bodily practice. But I mean, I guess maybe, you know, in the case of Katie, you are talking about bodily practice, but in some ways, it's also about a spiritual practice. It's a psychological, mental, psychic process, right? Um, so that that was kind of an interesting uh, point of continuity in the way that all three of you are presenting. Um, and 
I don't know if you have you know thoughts you want to share with each other about it, but it was just something that was uh, that struck me in listening to you. Or if no one wants to say anything, I can pass along to the first question. Um, maybe I'll give you a little time to think about that. So a question from the audience uh, from Chip B uh, for Katie. So how did INS uh, Kayutanam become an alternative form from the dominant colonial government schools in terms of its attitudes and art craft curriculum? Thanks, Javid, and thanks, John, for your comments, as well as uh, to Min and Chan Chan for your presentations. Um, I'll respond to what you said first, John. Um, I think you're right in your observation that arts, arts did not fall into the realm of curriculum at INS that was focused on practical skills. There were classes that were focused on like learning how to build buildings and like learning how to farm agricultural yeah. practices and things like that. Um, so interestingly, art and craft didn't fall into that category. Um, and in one of Shaifi's texts, he, uh, maybe it's not Shaifi's, I think it's by an alumnus of the school. He talks about how it was never INS's goal to produce artists. Mm -hmm. Artists were produced by the school and that some big names came out of INS, such as the artists that I mentioned. But the idea was that students would get a sense of kind of everything. And if they had a um, an Indonesian bakat or like a talent or calling for art, they would leave West Sumatra in order to pursue it, um, which also kind of ties into the matrilineal character of Minangkabau society. There's long been a tradition of outward migration and a kind of expectation that you would leave West Sumatra in order to pursue um, your skills or talents or to acquire more knowledge. Maybe another reason why INS like doesn't receive that much attention or didn't grow to be something bigger. Um, in regards to Chabib's question, kind of one of the key ways that it was alternative to the colonial government schools, it didn't take any funding from the colonial government, and so it was self-sufficient. Um, in terms of its attitude towards like an art and craft curriculum, there are actually a lot of parallels, I think, in terms of the way the arts were taught. Um, and what I compare it to is a colonial school that was located in Bukit Tinggi, a city um, that was kind of a center of the colonial government in West Sumatra, where drawing was taught and, and it was very much focused on uh, drawing models, um, going out, drawing from life. The same sorts of um, activities were used within the curriculum of INS. And Wakidi, the painter I mentioned, he had studied at the colonial government school as had Shaifi, who Shaifi also taught some of the art classes at, Kai, at INS. And so there was a, a, a kind of absorption of the practices of teaching art from the colonial schools at INS, but where it was different was really its kind of insistence on questions of nationalism and fostering a, a local identity through the school and its curriculum more generally, and the fact that it had no uh, financial connection to the colonial regime. So I think that, yeah, I mean, I, I think the point that you're making, Katie, about the kind of the distinction between the curriculum and the kind of the extracurricular you know, status that art had is, is a kind of interesting one, um, you know, in the sense that it, you know, and in the way that it also positioned the people who came out of the school, right? Like, so no one came out of the school as an artist and the school was deliberately, explicitly not designed to, to make artists, right? Um, which is kind of, yeah, and in the way that then art, you know, becomes like this other thing, right? That kind of forms the individual. And I think that that's kind of, you know, um, an interesting point. Um, to I think to think about um, in the way that I think you know what one one thing that that and that maybe connects with um, a point that Min made in her presentation earlier in her uh, at the in an earlier moment in her presentation when she's talking about the doi moi kind of opening up right and um, you showed the slide Min of the um, of uh, Salon Natasha. And the way that that slide has been interpreted, or the kind of the, this image of Doi Moe as kind of being the kind of the, um, the opening up or the unsuppressing of, of individual liberty, right? And one of the things I think that, um, I mean, you don't necessarily explicitly say this, but I think that, you know, one of the strong uh, intonations that, of your presentation is that, in fact, it is not an unsuppression, but an alternate form of learning 
and making, you know, through through programs such as Senart, right, where people learn how to behave in a certain way, learn how to kind of play these interpretive games, and learn how to, you know, there is a certain kind of, uh, there is another kind of education that's working uh, in, in tandem with this kind of opening up, right? So it's not just that, oh, well, we don't have this kind of, you know, um, socialist kind of uh, repression anymore. And so people can kind of just behave and, you know, this is how people, of course, will behave. But in fact, they are trained to behave in that way through certain kinds of ways, right? And I think that's kind of one of the interesting things is that it, in both cases, uh, whether it's Sanart or INS, it is about the kind of formation of, ultimately it's about the formation of individuals um, and the behaviors of individuals, like to, to kind of, you know, like learn how to kind of act in certain situations, right? And I, you yeah. know, I don't know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just to add to that too, um, like a lot of the art historical literature around that time too, there was a famous exhibition called Uncorked Soul, which was one of the first post doimoi exhibitions. And, and even like that title of like an uncorking of like, there's like carbonization in this bottle that's like being shaken out. I think in, in the exhibition text for that, I think it said something like, finally we can get over the monotony of the collective for individual expression. Um, and I don't know, I, I think this is like based on my, my own predilections or, or like interpretations, but I, I think back to what you were saying, it's, it's interpreted as like individual output, but I think what I have observed in San Art and like other collectives is it's, there is an individualized expression maybe, but it, it is all very social and um, dependent on social forms of production and social mm -hmm. forms of learning and making and whether yeah. or not that making is like one work it, it's still socially informed yeah. and i may i think that you know one of the things that i think is uh, a parallel between what um you know the point the kind of the practice that san art implements and what you're calling the kind of the social production of space right as aesthetic practice and what Katie is talking about, you know, in terms of INS and the kind of the, the, the goal, the purpose of INS um, in forming individuals is, you know, what I think, you know, alternately could be called a form of social sculpture, right? Where ultimately um, art is a kind of a way of reshaping or kind of trying to reform or kind of like reshape the way that society itself can, can behave, which I think is, is, is a little different than what uh, San San is talking about in the sense that, you know, in the case of Kafa's experimental art program, it is very much explicitly um, about the kind of the induction of what had been called or considered outsider art, right? And the way that then it becomes um, maybe uh, assimilated to a kind of more a uh, state uh, driven state kind of oriented kind of uh, curriculum, right? And it becomes in some ways uh, formatted uh, with Chinese characteristics as you point out, right? Uh, yes, I think, you know, the most important difference between the old system, the old, uh, the old pedagogy in the, you know, in the earlier system is that because, you know, they invent a whole new way of creating artworks, like they put, you know, first is come up with the, the concept or idea and then try to use various methodologies to realize these ideas. And then no matter what kind of materials or skills, even if they can use realism, they can use installation art, you know, as long as it express, express a concept or idea, it is, it is okay. So it does not have to be political or unpolitical or, you know, uh, what whatever like drawing or print making or different kind of ways of expressing, you know. So I think you know there's a emphasis on methodology. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a kind of a good point in the way that it kind of becomes codified, right? There is a kind of like um, this is this is how we define experimental art. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another question from the audience uh, for San San. Uh, who asked, can you talk more about why conceptual art was allowed to be taught in the art academy, given the tumultuous cultural history of the previous decades? And was this particular to Kappa? Um, and 
Oh, okay. Um, I think there's uh, I think there's a, a difference between you know the 1990s and 2000s because in the earlier part we think you know conceptual art is kind of avant-garde art or you know this kind of uh, but this name the experimental art was later or simply appropriated for a certain kind of educational program in China we just use that name but does not have any I think it does not have any direct relationship with earlier you know, definition of experimental art. We just use that name because mm -hmm. it's kind of experimentation. You don't have to mention about the contemporary art because it might cause some issues, right? So um, I think, you know, like conceptual art, like, you know, I mentioned the German uh, scholar who teach conceptual art in China in, mm -hmm. in the Central Academy of Fine Arts, you know, it's basically taught students kind of theories and also, you know, practices to using various media. So it's, it's kind of allowed because it's, it's, it's within the limit of the, um, you know, you know, the academic requirements. So it's, it's a, I think, it, you know, it's that kind of part of an educational uh, curriculum or, you know, pedagogies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, there's one more question from the audience, uh, from Dee, who asks, can you speak about the relationship? I'm not sure if it's addressed to anyone in particular, but can you speak about the relationship between aesthetic and moral education inculcation and its relationship to autonomous, uh, autonomous political identities? Um, this sounds like something that maybe is addressed to you, Katie, in terms of the ident political identities. I'm not sure if you have anything you'd like to say right now about that or. I'm not quite sure how to answer this. Um, <laughs> I guess I, like the only thing I can sort of think in, re in relation to like how we might think about the aesthetic education at INS, especially in its early years um, as related to either a moral education or the formation of political identities. Um, and sort of a point that I was trying to stress towards the end and something I'm thinking about more in my research is what was the significance of this at the school of what was likely a strong attention to landscape painting at a moment in which there is a shift in kind of discourse on what Indonesian modern painting would look like towards an attention, um, an attention to subjects with a greater uh, relationship to reality. Um, and so what does it mean then to somehow tie a particular aesthetic to a place, um, possibly to uh, religious identity, cultural identities there? Um, I don't have an, an exact answer, but just a few thoughts on the matter. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that this is actually a good, I've been seeing Lily nodding along. So I kind of feel like this would maybe be a good moment to, to, to bring, bring you in, Lily. So um, uh, up next, we will have some remarks from Lily Chumley. Uh, and just to say a few words about, um, about Lily. And thank you to this three panelists. Um, but uh, Lily is an anthropologist and associate professor at New York University. Uh, her book, Creativity Class, Art in School, uh, Art School and Culture Work in Post-Socialist China it was published in 2016 and is the first sustained look at the evolution of Chinese art students and the rise of the post-socialist uh, China's culture industries. Um, I'm keeping it short at, uh, at her request. So uh, without further ado, uh, Lily Chumley. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for your introduction. I really enjoyed the, the two sessions so far, and I'm looking forward to next week as well. But particularly today, uh, I'm, I have a little talk to give, but I want to first say some things on picking up on where the discussion was and, and uh, to each panelist. Um, first, uh, I really enjoyed um, Katie's uh, reflection on the history of um, Okay, I'm gonna get the acronym wrong because I slid it in, on INS, right? Um, and the history of INS, and in particular, returning to the text, like the texture of the text, and thinking about the um, origin figures, right, that organize education. And of course, um, for uh, those of us thinking about Chinese education systems, the role of Shu Hong, for example, who Shan Shan also mentioned today, right? Like it's, it, it's hard to escape and is foundational. And it's really interesting to think about education systems that have um, 
a core moral framing in terms of a founder, right? And a, a place to return to as an ethical system because I don't think that's always the case, uh, at least um, in my long ago experience as an art student in the US um, in American art education that there's necessarily that sense of a central um, uh, uh, ideational and moral core. Right? And so thinking about what it means to work inside of a system that has one and, and reflect on text as core is really generative and how that sets up a whole set of practices. And this question that you came to at the end of the um, provincialism, right? That, that like the, the province is the place where you can do moral education that is playing with art materials uh, and not organized toward professionalism. Right, and that professionals are kind of exiled towards centers. Um, and, and I think anchoring work in um, programs that are, are not treated as or regarding themselves as central for ed art education studies can be really generative, right? Because it opens our, our sensibility. And, and similarly um, with Mint's um, uh, presentation, oh, I mean, such a, a really fascinating case to think about. And, 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 and you know, I thank you for the reference. That, that you gave to my work, but I, I think that there's something really profoundly distinct and generative to focus on in the collaborative education space of sign art that you described, right? And, and one irony that kept coming up to me is how much this sounded like radical socialist art experiments um, in various um, moments in the history of socialist education that are about like escaping the academy and, its powers and setting up community centers that are about mutual education, right? Um, and that are not premised on a model of certification and tuition, um, but on something else. And I think, um, you know, uh, bringing that, uh, you know, framing of an ideal about education to bear on Sonar, um opens really generative questions to me, right? Because one of the things you're talking about that is that it's not just learning um, modes of contemporary art discourse for framing art in one place, but learning how to play with ambiguity and multivalence and move the uh, framing from one context to another and shift fluidly. And that kind of uh, learning happens in this collaborative space, right? Um, and, and there's something really uh, powerful about considering the political significance of ambiguity rather than directness. Right? <laughs> There's so much of the history of socialist critiques of bourgeois art is about bourgeois art's uh, indulgence in ambiguity versus socialist art's emphasis on direct statements, say what you mean, right? Um, that, that ambiguity can be a kind of political power in some contexts or, or has to be, is of necessity, right? Um, and, Yes, yeah, it's just such a really, really fascinating um, uh, practice that that uh, Sonart has developed, and that is really, uh, and that I, I hope people in uh, many art contexts can think about learning from. Right, um, that stepping away from the academy and its and its dangers. And finally, Shan Shan, um, I really love this framing of the curriculum of the experimental art program. I spent some time in the, the, the materials experimental class, the, the Tadao Shinan class, um, uh, and they were doing a lot of life drawing in 2007, 2008, and some in 2009. Uh, and they were um, doing a lot of uh, long form life drawing, but with experimental materials, like playing around with pigments um, and uh, thinking about how that program um, both distinguishes itself from other programs in Kafa because there's this process of separating out into really distinct studios. And then also to John and your point from the discussion you were just having, replicate certain structures, right? That have to, there are certain correct curriculum formats that have to be enacted across multiple programs. And so for example, um, the interweaving of foundation courses in drawing and foundation courses in Chinese art forms and mural painting and the, the range of, of courses that are sort of drawing on the whole history of Kappa's pedagogy in, in that program is so really interesting. And, and of course, then the question of like materials work keeps coming up in all three cases, right? Like what are the traditional 
art materials against which each of these forms of education is defined, right? What does it mean to depart from the, the, the art materials store? And, um, and I think uh, thinking a little bit about materials as a core concern or the, the dependence of many programs in art training on a su steady supply and market in a very limited range of materials is, is always a useful place to think about, but especially um, to John's opening points, as we think about the uh, transnational histories of art education, right? Like what are the materials that get defined over and over again as the core emblems of modernity and against which people uh, push in various moments seeking other materials, right? Like making pigment out of ash, which is one of the longest histories of pigment making anywhere ever. And in fact, most pigments that you can get in charcoal classes are made out of ash, but then you get the experimental materials program burning wood and making their own ash to make their own new materials, right? So it's some sort of wrestling with that industry of media that lies at the core of so much art education, of making pigments, um, papers, things like that. So yeah, some disorganized thoughts on them. You have, and now I have a little bit of a retrospective um, thoughts that I put together. Um, I don't know if it would be, I can share screen or if you guys, if somebody could pull that up, that would actually be great. Yes, so I was thinking about these core contradictions that appeared in the moment of the book. Um, and I wanted to start with this thinking that um, based on reading your abstracts before the session, um, thinking about how some of those connect. Next slide, please. Okay, so in the book, um, for j just since this is, <laughs> you know, uh, several years old work now, <laughs> um, I was really thinking about this question of post-socialism as meaning this period from 1978 to 2008. So using this term as a kind of translation for Geico Kaifang or the period of reform and opening up um, as a retrospective claim, right? So there's this moment in 2008 where there's a whole lot of work saying 30 years of reform, let's describe what happened in 30 years of reform. And I think um, one of the problems with using the word post-socialism for that purpose is that of course it implies this like uh, epic after which there is uh, continuousness, what comes after post-socialism or how can post-socialism ever end if it's defined as after 78? And I don't mean that at all. So although the book was published in 2016, it really focuses on the period up to 2008 and, and what comes after. These are really just sketchy thoughts, but I think that they correspond to some of the moments, the historical moments that have been described in the panels earlier in the week uh, and to, to some moments in the paper. So there's two key things that I think um, are seem to be going on. And one is that there is a turn, an internal turn in education systems. And there's a larger deglobalization trend far beyond China, um, evidenced in part by pandemic travel restrictions. But in the, by no means am I saying the pandemic caused that, right? There's a whole set of moves that really um, pull away from the idea of an endless globalization um, when within China specifically and, and more broadly. Um, and right now, a lot of international students um, all over the world are struggling with these uh, deglobalization trends very much in terms of how they can manage their visas for travel home to see family or how they can manage their visas for research and travel um, and family and school and the kinds of global lives that seemed like they would go on forever in 2008. The idea of um, endless easy travel is not the case, although now we have Zoom. So <laughs> Here we are on Zoom, the solution to this problem in a deeply global moment. And yet I think that there are some key changes that, that are worth thinking about. Next slide. Okay, so there were the three contradictions, I think, in, the, in 2008. On the one hand, you have um, 
moves toward a centralized curriculum and a centralized uh, institutional management. And on the other hand, you have enormous regional and institutional variation. So from, from the perspective of CAFA, for example, you will often get the very national story. CAFA innovates curriculum, which then diffuses through the whole country because CAFA is the premier school, right? Or the sort of anchoring in the center, a close relationship with the Ministry of Education, uh, national level. On the other hand, there's enormous variation and from other schools, you'll get that story much more. Oh, we're not really influenced by CAFA. We're not there. It's like, we have our own thing. We have our own history, right? And those dynamics played out in all kinds of ways down to the very details of like um, the, the aesthetics of the test in realist painting that would get kids into art school that still does get kids into art school where on the one hand, there's an idea of a central total curriculum, a uniformity. And on the other hand, there's emphasis on preparing for the styles required by different schools and they want a very different look. You know? And whether something looks very different or the same depends on who's looking at it, right? I ended up not writing about that variation in my book because when I would show pictures of these very different styles to people in the US, they'd often be like, that all looks the same and I don't see the point, right? And so it was like too subtle at some level, but within another context, that variation is extremely crucial. And so that the contradiction in these two narratives is an enduring feature. Number two, you have um, a tendency in 2008, this was really at its height, a, a whole set of incentives towards um, globalization. So the emphasis on English, the demand for universal English education, that was the first generation that had really been in English classes for a very long time. A preference for faculty with international degrees in key departments to the point that like students who in the past would have qualified for being hired as faculty at major art institutes with their degrees were feeling they had to go abroad for a year or two in order to um, go home to be hired again. Um, and then also foreign exchange, uh, including like, you know, my ability to be there as a visiting scholar uh, and lots and lots of foreign faculty such as the German uh, faculty that Shanta mentioned. And finally, there's this conflict and contradiction between, oh, sorry. And on the other hand, the contradiction with that is an emphasis on internal national political education. So you can see that in the curriculum that's focused on uh, Chinese aesthetics, uh, Chinese traditional art forms, uh, national needs, right? Um, so the dynamics of a push toward globalization and a push towards national identity as an ongoing contradiction constantly being managed. Third, you get this dynamic of, on the one hand, a whole set of state-funded work, um, contracts, exhibitions, um, positions, teaching positions, and on the other hand, market-based work contracts and exhibits, and the fact that most young graduates of art school are working in both at some level and having to be able to shift between these two registers and work across them. Um, rather than making a choice between one or the other, as, as might have been the case earlier on. Um, and the, the complementarity and the overlap between nominally state projects and nominally non-state projects is, um, you know, a key ambiguity in the professional life of a lot of young artists. Um, and I think that's something uh, uh, that plays out in style and genre distinctions very often. So a key example would be, you know, um, for example, at the, at the Shandong Academy of Art, the Chinese traditional art painting um, market there is sometimes um, framed as being very much about its proximity to the state, that it's a form of collecting that is driven by um, people in official positions. And on the other hand, um, it's often described as a, you know, a really lively art market that actually far exceeds the value of the contemporary art market in the area, um, even though it's sort of invisible from the point of view of people who are into contemporary art. And that question of like, is this about the state or is this about um, some sort of uh, market in cultural commodities 
kids play work down in, in people's discussions about their working life, right? And their lives of their exhibitions. So those are contradictions that I wrote about in the book that were very much there. Next slide, please. But so then there's been some changes from what I can tell. And, and you know, I've been at a distance and um, these are just guesses based on uh, people that I know and things that I've read and visits that I've made. So I'm really open to correction from uh, panelists and the audience on any aspects that seem unclear here. On the one hand, after 2011 in particular, you have increased regionalization of the undergraduate level curriculum through the province level administration of entry tests that starts in 2009, but 2011, it's already far along. And so that provincial administration, um, at least nominally, creates a more divided system rather than having students come from all over the country to test uh, at a few testing centers um, for uh, one central school, that there's a kind of um, sequencing of the test that leads to increasing provincialization. Um, and an expansion of those um, provincial art institutes, provincial not in the sense of a kind of value judgment, but meaning province level rather than national level. Um, uh, and that goes along with a whole lot of policies encouraging movement towards second and third tier cities, attempting to push population away from Beijing and, and Shanghai in particular. Um, and that dynamic, uh, you know, opens a lot of questions for me about how that changes the, the power dynamics between institutions and their curriculums, what happens in this shift. Right, um, and what is made possible um, or what is foreclosed by this change. So I think there's a retrenchment from globalization. So there's reduced hiring preferences for international degrees, reduced emphasis on international faculty, and more recently, you know, for good or ill, the, um, in, in many ways, in, to my mind, a good thing, the end of mandatory English education in favor of more options for second language instruction, right? But that means um, the end of a kind of emphasis on a very uh, Euro-American and Anglo-dominated globalization as the whole purpose of the education system, right? Um, an increasing emphasis on local political education. So if in 2008, the political thought classes were poorly attended and mostly of the students were sleeping. From what I hear more recently, there's a lot more pressure on those classes and you know, um, there's a lot more emphasis on them. And uh, it uh, becomes a more substantive part of people's lived practice of being able to, as Min put it, work between various registers of language right, in various contexts. And I think that is a really key dynamic, thinking about how people work within the rhetoric of the terms of that political education over in the terms of these key political texts. Um, and then finally, from, you know, so much in 2008 was about achieving uh, prominence in the world of commodity markets, um, the idea of a brand prestige in international markets as the apotheosis of art and design education. What would it mean to have succeeded in art and design education from the point of view of culture industries policymakers? It would mean having major Chinese brands, right? Um, that, that's one sort of rhetoric that was constantly there for the funding of art and design schools. And, and that uh, seems to be less of the core goal these days or less of the rhetoric and a lot more about the core work of artists and designers, which is you know, a wonderful thing because that pressure to um, think about branding as the core of uh, art and design work is not you know, in, in so many ways unhelpful. So yeah, these are key changes that I think are really affecting art students' lives. Next slide. Okay, so you know, if for a long time, the goal of investments in higher education was becoming more competitive in the global economy or what Yoshin called competitive developmentalism, how might art schools change as political objectives change? That's the question to me, right? When globalization and developmentalism are no longer the primary or the only keywords of the state 
and this funding is not driven by it. Although those political goals were never the only goals of students or artists <laughs> living and working inside of those institutions, they have a kind of impact, right? And so, so what kinds of um, changes are made possible by these changes? Um, recently, Elizabeth Perry has argued that academia may serve as an anchor of authoritarian stability with this idea of educated acquiescence. And of course, this is familiar. This is, you know, for you, the state nobility or also there, the, um, you know, uh, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> ISA. Um, however, this lesson is that arts of the political history of art schools in China is that they can also be key sites of ideological conflict. And it makes me think back to Andrew's 1995 Painters and Politics in the People's Republic of China, which goes into the long history of conflicts over the specifics of curriculum. Right? Like, what is the right style? What is the aesthetic to be? Um, major conflicts that led to people being pushed out of the schools entirely, right? Um, uh, students being sidelined or raised to the center, conflicts that took the form of art, right? Um, that were mediated through artistic style. Um, and so I guess I'm not entirely convinced by this idea. Um, that Perry has, or that, you know, grad students in sociology are often taught that, that academic centers are just uh, sites for the reproduction of dominant uh, hegemonic ideology. They're that for sure, but the question is what are the kinds of contestations that happen within it? And I guess um, I do think that there's a reason to attend to the kinds of fault lines, aesthetic, stylistic, and ideological that have been there in Kafa and many, many other art schools for a long time because the stakes have in the past gotten high and, and they might again. So that's that's all I have to say. Um, the end. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, I don't know if that, that's all. I think that's a lot. <laughs> that's uh, quite, a, quite a bit for us to think about, I think. Um, uh, thank you so much, Ali, for the uh, very, I think um, the term that you use is generative, you know, very generative remarks, um, both the responses you have to the, uh, to the three panelists, but also in sharing your own thoughts about, you know, the, the kind of how you're seeing your work, in, you know, and how it kind of may be the afterlife of, um, of what you have been researching and how we can think about these questions of education and um, how it, um, how, how to kind of maybe position that. I mean, I, it, 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 one thing that has been kind of on my mind and uh, from, the, from the moment that this panel was kind of assembled, you know, um, it, it strikes me that, uh, it occurs to me that, you know, it's not entirely accidental that um, on this panel anyway, we have, you know, people who are thinking about education and schools and two of you are kind of working on a more, from a more anthropological perspective and thinking, you know, um, thinking in terms of these questions, because you know, if we're dealing with education, we're not dealing with art objects per se, we're dealing with kind of practices that have direct impact on um, the shaping of people, right? Um, and how people function and behave and re relate to one another, right? Um, and so one of the things that um, I think uh, the, the kind of the focus on schools and education does is a kind of, shifts the focus, right? It's kind of like thinking about the, the maybe, at least in what you were, the remarks you were making, the way that, um, you know, it's not just the case that people automatically behave a certain way or, you know, will want to learn English. It's because there are certain government policies that favorize that or that, you know, like hiring practices that encourage people to do that, right? And so there are all kinds of little, little decisions and little details that amount to larger social changes and social preferences. Um, and schools are a place where these kinds of details and practices kind of, you know, gather, right? And shape um, and kind of uh, have a kind of entirely um, very concrete bearing on the way that entire generations get formed. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting, I think, uh, interesting reminder that you make about the kind of shifts, at least in the case of China, uh, pre-2008 and after 2008. Uh, I, can I respond to that really quickly? I just, yeah, yeah, sure, I sure. Think, I think 
that um, one of the dangers of social science in art, like sociology of art or anthropology of art, um, mm -hmm. is a tendency to uh, focus on those broader institutional and social structures, right? And mm -hmm. lose track of the, uh, of the form. Um, yeah. And uh, on the other hand, um, one of the dangers in some kinds of art history is to focus too much on the, the, the form and traditions and, and maybe lose sight of some of the political context. And obviously in both, we're always seeking like the right middle place. Um, I guess I do think that when you're talking about art education systems that are um, really systemic in the sense that like CAFA is curriculum is um, deeply tied to the purposes and goals of the Ministry of Education and the relationship between uh, state level educational policies and the you know, management of the school itself is really um, straightforward. Right? Um, and so in that way, it's very different from INS right, or San Art as places where uh, people can kind of detach from maybe, uh, you know, um, central purposes like um, uh, shifts in state policy can affect funding, uh, can affect curriculum, can affect how departments get organized um, so dramatically. I mean, um, hmm. there was been a massive um, expansion, or as Min put it, explosion, right, um, in art schools and the question of what they're for in after that. Uh, competitive developmentalism, I think, I think will be open at some point, you know, and there will be other things they have to do. It's not that. Uh, San San Min and uh, Katie, do you have uh, responses to Lily's remarks or other thoughts that you'd like to share? Uh, can I go first? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so thank you very much for your, you know, the introduction of your work. And I, um, I think, you know, he, uh, like, you know, you mentioned there are several contradictory contradictions between like, you know, the general curriculum, the state policy, and also the regional vari variations. And in, in a case like, you know, for example, China is large country, right? And different places have different characteristic or, or regional features. And then like Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts, they're more interested in this media technology so in their experimental art program, they emphasize on the technology or multimedia, but the, like in the Shandong province, because it's kind of traditional and then people emphasize has a long tradition of emphasizing realism. So basically art, experimental art program offers the methods, the methodologies, but not confined to, not confined to specific media. They can use like social realism to express the concept or idea. It depends on their own, you know, regional feature. It's not like, you know, uh, we have a uniform, this kind of experimental, the definition or the form or the style. So this is what I'm thinking. And also um, another thing is your uh, observation about the phenomena after 2008. I think like China emphasized on this, you know, localization. Like, you know, especially for example, like oil painting is introduced from Western countries in the early, in the late 19th century, uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And then uh, later, you know, we have in the 50s, people, you know, advocate this kind of should be rooted, rooted in Chinese tradition, not, you know, as a Western form of art. So I think this tendency is echoes the phenomenon of today. Like we, like uh, you know the you know the uh, the the national policy said you know we can learn we should learn from Western countries, but we also have to have our own tradition, not borrow everything from Western countries. So I think they have they 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 they, they pro uh, promote this idea, like China have to have its own you know root in tradition, and then try to borrow what is appropriate and into the system. So this is what I'm thinking. Um, can, I, can I just respond to that a little bit? I think this is such an interesting and, and key moment um, for the framing of what is 
Chinese and what is Western. And, and um, one thing that I've noticed in the art education um, journal essays that I've been reading, I had a couple at the end of the slides, but didn't want to go into them, um, is that sometimes the same techniques can get framed as oil painting traditions coming from France and as Western, um, or as traditions that come with Maximov uh, through the Soviet influence. And to the degree they're Soviet, then they're not um, as Western, and therefore they can be legitimated in a different way. And in this moment, right, in, in art education, professional publications in 2019, 2020. And that's really interesting, right? Because the, the contrast, um, given the transnational history of art that we've been learning about all this week are not absolutely national, right? And every moment is the question of which media, which forms, which styles are getting identified in which ways and what the political stakes of those identifications are, right? Um, that's key. Yeah, and like, uh, I think like oil painting, the case of oil painting, I think in the 50s, like Luo Gong Liu emphasized, you know, this oil painting must fit the Chinese, you know, situation. And then uh, like now, you know, we, we have this earlier like social realism from the French tradition, right? And socialist realism from the Russian, the Soviet Union tradition. And then we like in the 80s, you know, people have this ideology uh, liberation and then advocate a return to the social realism. So I think, you know, after all kind of development, China try, Chinese artists try to find their own way of, you know, localize this kind of different media, this, this art. Um, uh, I, I think like, you know, we, 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 we talk about, you know, like the other kind of media like conceptual art or installation performance. And this is, you know, allowed in China, but have to be you know, appropriate for the Chinese context. So this is the national policy. I think strengthens much a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe Sansan, uh, maybe now is the appropriate time to bring in a question from the audience uh, from Sol Li, uh, mm -hmm. who asks that uh, Sansan, I see a class on Mintian. Uh, folk folk art in the experimental mm -hmm. art curriculum. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little more about what is actually taught and how it relates to the new, new constellation of artistic practices under experimental art? Oh, oh actually, uh, Lu Shengzhong is a folk artist, actually. He is skilled as at this paper cut, that red small figure, that's this paper cut. So originally in CFA, he was in the Department of Folk Art. And then later, this department was changed, you know, and when several transformation and then became part of experimental art. You know, this is kind of his specialty, but he, like his own work, he tried to, you know, use this old kind of art form, but create something new, not, you know, just follow the, the folk art, the intangible culture, whatever they, they call it, you know, this tradition, but used as a vocabulary to fit into his own idea, to fit, to express his own, you know, concept. So I think, I think, you know, I, I look through these courses introduction, but they encourage students to, to, to study these local things like crafts and then trying to make it more contemporary. So this is. Um... I had a comment. Uh, I was really compelled by you saying that the period of post-socialism is over. And I, I think I return to that concept a lot too, because it's, it's so controversial or or like there's so much dispute about it. And I think I get really caught up in like the dispute, but I never think about it as a periodization period. And I never think about something coming after it. I just always think about it just going on forever and describing the, the aftermath of something. So I wanted to hear more about what you were thinking or if you um, of like other terms or if there's like other scholarship that is sort of signaling at this post post period. Yeah, I think, I think that there is a lot of um, work basically in the last few years that has been pointing out that the idea of a severing with the past that was really um, a key part of the historical framing in 
not just within um, the art exhibitions that I wrote about in the book, but in all kinds of places and moments in all kinds of political speeches and rhetoric, right? Um, in the general framing of the, like Hu Jintao's uh, framing of his role in history, right? For example, um, uh, that some of what seemed like uh, an endless break in, from that moment, like around 2006, 2007, really didn't seem like an endless break by 2013, 2014, right? Because there's a question of recuperation or neo-Maoism or the return of socialist reference points. On, um, and I guess I think that that idea of a return seems weird and anachronistic if you believe that there's a historical break, but if you frame it as, um, a certain time period that was self-consciously framing itself as post. So there were all of these uh, retrospective movies, um, you know, showing montages and sequences that would go through the decades. And it would be like from then to now, uh, you know, as a, a contradiction. But it becomes very clear that there's a moment in history where it's important to make a distinction or to, to separate. Um, and then there's another moment in history where it's important to tie those ends back together and reclaim that. And so, for example, um, in 2007, there were not that many early history of the party TV shows. But by 2014, there's a ton of TV shows about the early underground party all the time, right? And so that would seem like a backwards movement in history, but of course it's not from the point of view of, uh, of another kind of retrospective moment, which is the party's anniversary of its founding, right? Which then changes the scope of what's relevant. Um, and from the point of view of official art exhibitions, because those official art exhibitions, which are also held in art schools all over the place, like Kafa has them thematically, students are called upon to do thematic work for, um, themed history exhibitions all the time. Thematic exhibitions um, lay out for art students, present opportunities for fulfilling or visualizing these historical imaginaries, you know, whether it's like reform and opening up, that's the key thing to visualize at a certain moment. And then another moment, it's like the long history of the party from its founding to, to now, um, which encompasses that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Often directly with like a set of prompts that are being circulated out and, you know, through teachers and um, through curators, through museums, through magazines, through all kinds of things, you know? Lily, one thing, that, so you, you pointed out in the kind of the situation uh, post 2008 is the kind of increasing um, regionalization uh, and the way that there's a certain kind of decentralization and provincial differences assert themselves, right? Um, and and that connects uh, to something else to, that you 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 said in the uh, in kind of response to Katie's paper, um, which has to do with the question of the provincial and the province, right? And um, I think Katie, in your in your presentation, you were kind of thinking of you, the, the way that uh, West Sumatra is positioned as somewhat marginalized to kind of the dominance of Java. Um, but in some ways, Lily, what you were kind of suggesting is that perhaps that also allows a certain, viewed one way, it is a, a certain kind of dominance by Javanese culture or society, but viewed another way, it allows for a certain kind of freedom or kind of um, a, a openness for experimentation. And Katie, I was wondering if you could, uh, could respond to that. Uh, so that's one part. And then secondly, I kind of, I was wondering if as a group, uh, you know, uh, you might have thoughts about this kind of, you know, the post 2008 moment and the deglobalization and what this means in terms of the kind of um, variations that might be happening uh, in other, all parts of the world and not just in China or in Indonesia, you know. Yeah, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, I'm thinking more about just kind of the significance even of looking at West Sumatra in relation to Indonesian art history. Um, mm -hmm post 2008, I mean, in Indonesia, it was 1998, and then even more so in 2008, that there was a greater attention to what was happening outside of Java in 1998. Um, 
Suharto's regime came to an end and there was uh, uh, policies that put into place processes of decentralization. So greater attention was paid to the provinces. Um, and I really think at this moment, um, there was like even amongst West Sumatran artists or Minangkaba artists that were working in Java, there was a greater attention to their regional identity that mm -hmm. has even more recently um, come back to an interest in history and now being able to play a bit more with the legacies of, say, a, an aesthetic like landscape painting um, mm -hmm. outside of Java that wouldn't necessarily be possible in Java or of relevance in Java. Um, mm -hmm. For example, there's a landscape painter who lives in West Sumatra who very much takes Swakidi as a kind of reference point, um, mm -hmm. tries to go out, paint on the spot like Swakidi does and produces large scale landscape paintings that are almost kind of photo realists in precision. Um, and I, I've written an article a little bit that references his work and just kind of how um, when it was put on display in Java, the reception from a community of Minangkaba artists, um, in contrast to say the larger art world in a city like Yogyakarta on the island of Java, um, where that kind of work yeah, was paid little heed. Um, so yeah, the province does definitely allow for a different kind of experimentation in a way, or a kind of reverence for styles that are no longer paid heed um, in the nation center, which is kind of interesting. And in this case, it's really landscape painting. Um, something though, that's kind of, that I've been thinking a lot as I'm listening to the different comments um, is also kind of the relationship of politics and how much politics has actually influenced um, the trajectory of INS. You know, it was founded in 1926 and it's still in existence today, but it had these huge periods of inactivity that makes it a really a difficult site to study. It's kind of a peripheral interest in relation to my larger project in part because it's hard to find out really what was happening there. Um, and your comment, Lily, about these uh, kind of origin figures that, uh, you know, we have a lot of information about the thinking of somebody like um, Mohammed Shaifi, but we don't know that much actually about the activities, the objects that were produced in the classrooms. You know, I've sh I showed you all some of the only photos that I've come across of what was happening at the school. Um, you know, West Sumatra leading up to the revolutionary struggle was a key part of, the, you know, the nationalist struggle, the fight for independence, the after independence. Um, there is a separatist movement in this region because the region wasn't recognized or didn't feel that it was recognized for its contributions. Um, so then this led to a period of like a number of decades where like not much was happening there. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting site also in relation to the political history of that region that I didn't really get to talk about in the presentation, but um, I really appreciate the comments because what does it even mean to then look at the history of a school like INS that really is almost a history of the thinking behind its founding father. You know, it has legacies in the 60s and 70s, but if we're talking about it in the context of the 1920s, um, it means something different. So it's, it's exciting to begin to think about it a little bit more with all of you. Uh, does it, do you have any takers on the question of deglobalization and how it's playing out more recently? Like, I mean, Min, uh, you were you were talking, you know, in your presentation, you were talking more about the '90s moment. I was wondering if you might kind of hazard uh, some comments on what's been happening uh, in Vietnam in, let's say, the last 10, 15 years, in terms of you know independent um, uh, organizations or artist initiatives that are are kind of you know like uh, coming into being. I mean, I'm asking this because one of the things that um, you know, just as Lily was talking about 2000, post 2008 within China, one of the things that, you know, I've been kind of mulling over is, you know, um, as we're doing this program of art schools of Asia, you know, it is a moment when um, for various reasons and various contexts, artists are creating projects that are very much about the creation of social space, right? I think, in, you know, what you're talking about with San Art has become kind of a model for many artists in many different regions and contexts, you know, to basically create, um, uh, collective um, endeavors, right, that are not about the production of objects, but about kind of education and other kinds of social practices or forms, right. Um, and so I'm kind of curious about, you know, like this, like large, this, like the reasons for this and thinking about that and, you know, what it is that, you know, um, if there's a way to think about some common, uh, common commonalities between, you know, what 
all of these different uh, issues might be. Yeah, I can offer some thoughts on that. I don't know if I can answer the the withdrawal from globalization question, mm -hmm. um, but I think like, I'm really interested in um, like communal communitarian practices or like the idea of production of social space as art. And it's it's very broad too. It's kind of impossible to categorize like conceptual art. It, it is conceptual art, but it's 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 impossible to categorize. And although there are like art historical Western canons that try just as with conceptual art and with communal collective practices, it's also something that's very global. And with that too, there are like lots of different reasons for why people do this um, all around the world. And like um, a, a really landmark exhibition text that I think about all the time is Global Conceptualism by Louise Chemnitzer and Rachel Weiss and Jane Farber um, at the Queens Museum in the in 98 or 99, where they, yeah. they charted um, conceptualism, which they distinguish from conceptual art, which kind of had um, like a Western art, North American um, canon of being like, um, like uh, following minimalism or, or just being these like institutional critiques. Um, and what, what they were arguing was like these works, the conceptual around the world were in places like China and Latin America um, and Africa um, and we're actually responding to like social, we're, we're not only influenced by social movements, but we're like responding to them directly. And we're um, sites where people were asserting agency with things like suppressive governments, um, mm -hmm. mobilizing, building um, knowledge production, um, building political consciousness. Um, yeah, so I guess like conceptual, conceptualism it's I mean like the the documenta is a really good example of how um, the theme of documenta by Ron Grupa of being the Indonesian concept for gathering and resource sharing or knowledge sharing I think it's an enduring popular form because it's it's like more democratic it's more accessible it it like the idea that like, gathering can be or anything can be art is just so much more accessible. You don't really have to have a, a background or like materials to do it. And I think that back to um, that quote from Akwi that I mentioned in my presentation of, I think there is like a teetering dynamic of these practices coming out of times of crisis too. And like, I think about that a lot with Documenta um, being like a huge festival, basically highlighting all these communal practices in a time of like global catastrophe <laughs> across the world yeah. you know so there's like a, like a sort of withdrawal from politics as we know it into these like kind of like um enclave communities or like smaller forms of communitarianism yeah i mean i think that I, yeah that oh, katie sorry, sorry. Uh, i don't i don't want to cut you off but um no no Maybe to build on what Men's saying, um, and Ruang Rupa is a great example, and the case of Documenta, and maybe to be a little bit more cynical and thinking about 2008 and what came after in Indonesia, especially the rise of the market. And all of a sudden, there have also been these opportunities available to collectives that previously worked in, on a very kind of small scale and were fighting against oppressive regimes. Um, and very difficult um, political economic context. And all of a sudden now there are these platforms in which they're able to display and create um, the product of a kind of dialogic process, which I don't know if it's good or bad. Um, I've been following Taring Padi, a collective from Indonesia who is at Documento preparing for their contribution to the show and you know Taring Padi was formed in you know the context of the reformasi movement bringing down the Suharto regime and continues to exist now as this like very well recognized international collective um, which is just kind of and you know and the members of the group travel all over the world now um, and would that be possible if it weren't for 
just kind of the structure of the international contemporary art world and these large scale exhibitions um, for better or worse. And I think San San uh, is kind of in a similar context in that like now they, they're very well recognized regionally. Um, uh, but like we're such a small thing, which is so interesting. Sound art, you mean? Sound art, yeah, sound art, yes. sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry to cut. Oh, is it my turn now? Okay, so, um, yeah, so I mean, I think like responding to both of you, I think, I mean, thank you, Min, for bringing up documental because I think that that is something that, you know, obviously um, has been on my mind <laughs> for very uh, uh, obvious reasons or kind of clear reasons. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, like the, the question, uh, I mean, one of the things that, you know, in terms of thinking about this kind of post-2008 moment and the way that there is a kind of like um, an emphasis on the regional and the assertion of maybe local identity and local cultures. Um, so it's, you know, so that contemporary art, if it was the 90s was about kind of like certain globalizing practices and trends. So, you know, it's like, oh, let's have like, you know, and something you'll see when you come uh, is like, you know, let's say have performance art festivals around the world. And it's about kind of connecting that community of, you know, people, pr pr uh, practitioners from everywhere, right? And then they kind of start having these conversations. Whereas now it seems like, you know, um, there's a greater, I mean, there are still these global conversations going, but rooted maybe more in specific practices and kind of about introducing those specific practices into that, um, that network that is still global, right? So like Documenta is a place where you have people coming from Indonesia, from, you know, from Vietnam, from China, from wherever, uh, from Africa, you know, different parts of Africa all together. But at the same time, you know, um, what will be on view is kind of like, you know, um, very specific in terms of the references and in terms of the practices. And so, I mean, that's that's kind of one of the interesting things, and you know how that gets, how that get, how that reflects maybe in um, what is taught and how it gets taught. I think you know it is interesting. I think San San that you know like um, Lu Shenzhen is someone who comes from a paper cutting tradition, right? And how the paper cutting department or the kind of the the craft tradition, folk art uh, department, ends up becoming the basis of the experimental art department, and not something you know like painting or um sculpture which maybe you know would have would have been more hegemonic right in terms of more dominant so something which maybe wasn't so kind of you know dominant then ends up becoming the, the basis the way that province the province becomes something you know is has room for experimentation and freedom so craft art which is debased and devalued becomes like a space where people can rethink like what the signification and, and the uh, of the of those practices are. I mean, I think it, you know, we'll see that you, you can see this in document itself too, right? I mean, the way that craft has somehow become returned as a kind of form of conceptual or social practice, right? As opposed to being a traditional practice per se. But um, I have, uh, there's one more question from the audience. Maybe I'll go ahead and read this. Uh, this is a question for Lily, uh, a, a maybe very large question. Um, with the various developments you mentioned, such as the withdrawal from globalization, centralization of power, and the increasing emphasis on political education under Xi Jinping's re regime, there is a general wariness among cultural workers in China about the country returning to the Mao era, or in the worst case, to the Cultural Revolution. While there's obvious similarities in various aspects of social life, what are the risks of drawing simple parallels between the current situation and Mao? What are some possible frameworks to think about the political culture in China today beyond simply referencing the history? That is a very large question. Yeah, yeah that's a large question, but I think I think this is um, maybe uh, it's something that I've been thinking about for a while because the fact that there are aesthetics returning or phrases returning in political language right that that feel like they've returned in the way that john was just talking about like craft returning we can stage moments of return all over the place right for aesthetic form um is that's not the the key condition right it's something about um the stakes of the political situation or the stakes of the rhetoric that is the source of the wariness and the concern. Um, and it seems like the, 
I mean, again, um, um, from the perspective of, from my perspective in New York, that the things that are important to recognize are number one, how deeply um, that period of um, very liberal rhetoric around globalization, particularly in cultural flows, was embedded in an idea of endless progress, right? That things would just continue getting more open and more similar and more travel back and forth and that and more alike. Basically Fukuyama's end of history argument, right? That like after 1989, everything is just gonna get more and more and more unified and we're gonna be moving back and forth and people, more and more people will have apartments in five continents and you know spend their lives bouncing between one and another and that, that is the goal and the apotheosis of culture work is to spend a lot of time on airplanes and move around a lot right and that aesthetic and that sensibility and that the idea of endless progress um you know was always cut by fear of the many crises that we knew were coming, right? As, as Min has pointed out, or like what happened after 2008. And, you know, so just saying that um, if we recognize that that kind of naive idea of an endless, um, endlessly increasing market that would get invoked at certain points in the art world as a like basis for our optimism about, uh, an international future um, is problematic, then the key thing to pay attention to is, you know, well, what are the kinds of contours or ideas about history that might be getting mobilized in China right now that might set up some uh, situations that cause that wariness for, for people living in institutions trying to work through academies right trying to make it um make exhibitions happen under complicated increasingly difficult um situations in some cases right like what are the models of history that are getting invoked and that might be causing problems sometimes for some people or creating opportunities for others that, i guess that's the key question to me um and and i think that's where I wanted to kind of end with that critique of Elizabeth Perry, because if it's really easy to think of from in the way that US rhetoric often happens of being like Xi Jinping is the model of the um, autocratic leader, right? <laughs> or the, the, the of autarchy that, um, that that imagines a total uniformity and control. Um, and, and clearly that's not, the history of how art academies have been in many places in the world in in moments of real political struggle um, they're also internally conflicted and, and that can be a source of danger and opportunity obviously people are facing right now i think that's a really uh, good point to to be making that you know it's never entirely one thing or the other there's always a kind of um a way that um i think um Min used the the term pivot i think you know there's always a way that something can pivot right things can pivot in one direction or another um and unless there's uh, any final thoughts or comments from our three panelists, maybe that's also a good point to, to end today's uh, panel today. Um, last, last, last chances, anyone want to say anything else or if not, San San, are you? No, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I think like, you no, know, just a, uh, Responding to the earlier question, actually, uh, I have some thoughts because mm -hmm. uh, actually in Xi Jinping's talk, he mentioned several times that cultural revolution is a mistake. And uh, so I, I think that this is kind of discovered national identity, strengthen the national, like we call confidence. So like to reflect what he called like the, the Chinese spirit. So I think this has to do with this identity building because you know, maybe in the earlier period, you know, the, the, the free market uh, system 
make people realize, you know, you know how important the econ economy is. But now it's a return to the cultural value, like what our culture is and how to build our national identity. So like in Art Academy, they talk about, uh, you know, they, they, they painted like patriot, uh, patriotism, like this kind of paintings or artworks. So I think this is kind of like, you know, the, for example, like 19th century, you know, the neoclassicism, this kind of trend in China, you know, trying to find the, uh, the spiritual, like, you know, force to build national identity. So this is what I'm understanding about. Thank you. That's a that's a good point as well. Um, okay, so um, I think we are actually now about the time about time. Um, so thank you, uh, San San Min and Katie for your presentations and really for your um, wonderful remarks, and for all of you for this really engaging and um, thought provoking and very rich conversation um, today. And thank you to our audience members for joining us. Um, for, uh, for staying with us uh, on a Friday morning or a Thursday night, uh, depending on your, your, where you might be. And um, please tune in for next Tuesday when we will uh, be resuming the uh, uh, symposium with a fourth session um, and thinking about uh, learning outside a kind of institutional setting with presentations by Alice, uh, Alice Ashiwell, Hira May, um, and uh, uh, So Young Lim. Uh, so please uh, join in for that. And um, thank you again, all. And um, have a good uh, rest of your evening, day, and weekend. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much Thanks for organizing. Everyone.